let me warn you, I am going to talk like an idiot for the next 18 minutes, as promised. And I'm going to talk mainly about failure. Uh, just before this, I was having a conversation with a gentleman, and I was asked, you know, what if you mess up this talk? Would that be a failure or a success? I don't know. It's a divide by zero error. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so let, let me actually jump straight to it and tell you my ambition. Well, my vague ambition from the next 18 minutes is to demystify creation, creativity, innovation. The issue which, which I, I see as central to, to our progress is how do we unlock the creativity of the three billion new people, young people, who are going to enter you know, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, 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 productive years in the next decade. Now, uh, too often, too often, in fact, in our society, we equate creativity, innovation, with this mythical genius concept. I believe that's fundamentally wrong. And it's not just wrong, it's harmful. It's harmful because it makes creativity and innovation something very elitist, that only a selected, chosen, mysterious few are somehow gifted with, while the rest of us mere mortals are left to just be consumers. Now, uh, uh, let me actually jump back to my earlier comment of failures and relate the two here. So that's my vague ambition. Let me see if I can fulfill that in the next 18 minutes. And I'm going to try to do that with three truths, three learnings from my experience of a startup, which I, I'm the CEO slash janitor of uh, in Mumbai. And I'm going to try to bring home those lessons uh, here. Uh, like was mentioned, I, I relayed the success story of Touchbee at uh, TED in Long Beach, California uh, earlier this year in, in March. And uh, I talked about how we had gone about developing uh, a technology called Touchbee. Uh, this is a, a handheld device. Here I have it right here. So this little device is designed to be a prick-free blood analysis machine. It doesn't do everything right now. It measures hemoglobin in your blood, but without pricking. So you would just uh, put your finger in here, and in about 30 seconds, it will show up a value of hemoglobin and oxygen and a bunch of other stuff about your blood without pricking, right? Uh, we, we thought it was pretty cool, and we had developed it specifically to solve the problem of lack of access to any kind of diagnostic technology, really, in uh, most part of the world. I mean, in, in every village in India, you will find that there may or may not be a doctor. There will be a health worker, like a, a nurse, a midwife. But you will never find a working pathology lab. You will never find uh, the kind of uh, diagnostics facilities that many of us will take for granted if we live in Mumbai or in Boston, right? Um, so that's what we developed this. This is a point of care screening tool designed for the health worker. It doesn't require a doctor. Now, I'll come back to this a little bit more. And uh, the coolness, of course, is that it's non-invasive. It works on these uh, just a bunch of simple couple of uh, batteries here. And it's uh, one, button, one button operation, no needles, all of that. Uh, people came, came up to me after, after the TED Talk and said that, Mishkin, you're a genius, right? And again, in the short term, this was a good deal for me, right? In the, in the short term, people said I'm a genius. But within about two seconds of talking to me, they will realize, and you will realize in the coffee break, that I'm an idiot, right? <laughs> So in the long term, it's not such a good deal. And uh, luckily for me, uh, those thoughts went a little further when in the TED Talk, uh, the last TED Talk at, at Long Beach was given by uh, a brilliant researcher called Brené Brown. She talked about shame. And I realized, suddenly I realized that it's shame which is preventing us. It's shame of failure. We just are afraid to try something new because we're just afraid to fail. And to a large extent, I, I, I remembered you know, my own past and my, my friends, and that is really the only thing which is stopping us from innovating, from creating. Just ourselves, our own sense of shame. And uh, uh, Brené Brown, incidentally, uh, in the middle of her talk, I didn't realize this, suddenly she mentioned Mishkin Ingavle. I'm going to talk a little bit about this uh, researcher and uh, how he has failed 32 times. <laughs> so, <laughs> So there I am, right? I'm right there, one million page views and whatnot, you know, and uh, <laughs> I'm uh, somewhat of a critically acclaimed failure now. <laughs> so please listen to me. So uh, failure is a good thing, and, but it would be too simplistic to assume that just repeatedly failing many times will magically, uh, you know, make you uh, 
uh, develop something new, uh, develop a new product, new solution, uh, just an answer to a problem you've been searching for. Uh, I, I try to synthesize it into three points. Uh, I have a, again, background in consulting, so forgive me again to the three bullet points, but the three points I have are number one, you have to experience the pain. Uh, experience the pain of the specific problem which you're trying to solve. I know many uh, startups who have cool technology, who have developed really amazing things, but because they have not really experienced the problem, they have not really stood in the shoes of the person who is facing the problem, and especially I see this a lot in the so-called development sector, right? Uh, and this is a well-documented problem. But, but still, I, I, I do feel that somehow this has to be hammered home. Feel the pain, feel the pain. You have to step in those shoes and understand exactly how the product, service, or innovation is really going to change things for the better, for the worse, what is going to change. And uh, that's what, luckily for me, I'm not a doctor, but luckily for me, my two doctor friends uh, were working for one year in a rural part of India. Uh, I'll give the example of Parol because that's the... A most stark example, it's just two hours away from Mumbai, but it's still very, very uh, low on infrastructure, healthcare infrastructure. There's no, not, a big, big, not, not big path labs and uh, not a big, big deal of uh, you know, healthcare delivery happening there. But uh, what you do see here is that Abhishek and Yogesh, the two doctors in my team, knew exactly by the time they had spent one year how the system worked. They had seen, in our case, we were solving the problem of anemia. Uh, this mostly uh, addresses, uh, you know, it's mostly a big problem in the developing world for women and uh, uh, adolescent girls. Uh, of course, I, as you can see, I'm not either a pregnant woman or an adolescent girl. But Abhishek and Yogesh uh, were doctors. They had seen it right there in front of their eyes. They had seen patients come in with low hemoglobin counts, anemic, and they were susceptible to various complications, the chief amongst them being postpartum hemorrhage, so bleeding at the time of delivery, and mortality. Uh, secondly, even the babies themselves, because if, if they are born to an anemic mother, they would be uh, typically low birth weight babies. Again, who, the cycle would continue, and they would be susceptible to anemia. And until you have a, a, a tool which can break this cycle, because anemia is difficult to diagnose, remember? It's, it's not something I turn yellow or I have a fever. It's just a... Uh, very subtle symptoms, many times which are missed. So we had to solve that problem. And rather than having like a one-liner which says we had to solve the problem of diagnosing anemia, Abhishek and Yogesh knew very firsthand that it was the problem of this person you see highlighted there, the health worker they had to solve. How does she monitor anemia? How does she convince the patient to take the treatment? How does she change the course of treatment over a cycle, over a first trimester, second trimester, third trimester, so that you have anemia which is uh, well under control by the time the woman enters childbirth. How do you do all of those things? Th that is really the problem, not so much the diagnosis. The prevalence is so high, so 50% or more of uh, pregnant women in the developing world are anemic. So it's not the diagnosis, but the monitoring. Now, these kind of insights are what Abhishek and Yogesh knew, and uh, they could quickly sort of figure out that a device like this would work. And they, it had to be no needles, no pricking, like I mentioned, uh, no, no invasive procedure to, uh, that, that, had, that would require a lot of training, and it would also deter the, the, the patients from, from actually uh, doing this kind of uh, uh, test. It had to be simple to use, one button, no more. It had to be something which she could carry in her kit, right? Uh, she travels, this, this health worker travels all around uh, different villages. So this is what we built, right? Now, uh, experience the problem. If, if I had... I had tried to develop this on my own. It would have been a massive failure. I would have, you know, uh, made it sync with an iPhone or an Android phone. You know, very cool. Well, I'll talk about more <laughs> about that particular aspect soon. Right? So there you are. I already touched upon failure with that point. So I'll again jump straight to point number two. Fail early. Fail often. Fail as quickly as you can. I'm going to <laughs> advocate all of you to be massive failures in your life, <laughs> all right? It's important to do this early. Do not delay failure. Do not delay it, right? The more, it's inevitable. It will happen. The sooner it happens, the less expensive and the less painful it is for you, right? This, this is what we learned the hard way. I wish I had known this earlier. I realized in my startup, I have to develop explicit experiments designed to break stuff down, right? This machine I have to design I have to design a set of test experiments which will make it break, right? it, to make it fail. I have to release it to a customer who will be brutal in their criticism, who will say that this is not working, who will give me the feedback very early. 
not when I have invested $5 million in a rollout globally and uh, have you know, a huge amount of sunk investment. It's much easier to get that feedback on day three than on day 365, right? And that's what I, I really intend. It, it seems simple. It, it, I knew this. I mean, these points, I, I look up a blog by Paul Graham or something like that, and it, it's there on the website, right? But until you, I went to this cycle, I didn't really internalize it. I, I would, I, that's why I'm sharing it. So I'll give you some specific examples. Right? You see the probe here is different. This is the piece uh, which goes on the finger, right? Uh, and this is one of our early 2009 probes. Uh, you'll notice that it looks very remarkably different from this one. The mistake which we made back in 2009 was that, you know, thinking that we're all smart folks, all PhDs and whatnot from these Ivy League schools, you know, <laughs> that we have this nice software, we can design this super cool probe, you know, it's, it's, going, to, it's going to be super. So black is the color where light, you know, the, it's the best color from the engineering point of view for light not to, you know, mess things up. So we made it black. Velcro, wow, Velcro, why don't we develop a device, a medical device with Velcro, right? So <laughs> it could strap onto any finger. People have fat fingers, thin fingers. It works, right? And then uh, uh, on the technical side, side of things, it works on two wavelengths, two different wavelengths of light, like a device called the pulse oximeter. We thought that you know, if, if, if you could de de develop it like an oxygen measuring machine, you could do it. So all of these assumptions we made, put them into the design. For one year, we invested in making a product which was what we thought cool. And then we realized, when we took it to hospital trials, that no, it doesn't actually work, right? We don't know why it doesn't work, right? So I wish we had saved one year you know, from all of that uh, uh, useless you know, cycle of development if, if I had only you know, tried to throw it into the field, expose it to failure. That's my point, right? The context is so important, right? Failure, success, it's all very contextual. Who is your customer? What is the other uh, you know, uh, stuff, other things around your customer which are going to affect success or failure? In my mind, coming from a, you know, uh, I'm a geek, I love, love to swipe and do all kinds of cool stuff with a phone, right? Um, I, I thought, wow, healthcare, I want like instant connectivity between the point of care and the back end, and this, there'll be this health ministry and these doctors who can view all the results in runtime, in real time, on a map of anemia at the back end, on, on a web-based interface, I'll make it an API, <laughs> right? Um, all the cloud, the cloud, the cloud is going to be awesome, you know, for this. <laughs> So we built, in fact, I have this device here for me, and I keep it in the center of my office to tell everybody I meet, I bore them to death with this cool device. This is our 2011 version, which we piloted with NGOs in India. Right? So this little gadget sends the data uh, from just the probe, wirelessly via Bluetooth, to an Android phone, and then uh, links it via, via uh, something called uh, ODK, Open Data Kit, it links it back to any, any web-based uh, system. Uh, it's cool, but what we found is that it doesn't really satisfy the conditions in the field, right? So when, when, I, when we took it to the health worker, uh, we realized that, that the health worker there, A, she was seeing 1,000 patients a month. She had really no time to wait for you know, an Android phone to sync, she, she, doesn't, she wasn't in that zone, uh, that frame of mind at all. She had no patience with swiping. And what happened is that over a period of two months, we realized that it, the system fell into disuse because of the huge upfront training cost, the upfront cost of change, this buzzword, which was required uh, you know, before the health worker could really use it in her routine. So this was a learning. We, by last year, we were a little bit wiser than in 2009, so the moment we developed even a very rough kind of version of this, we had thrown it into the field. Uh, so that's, that's, that's just to illustrate the point, right? The third point, that admit that you're an idiot, right? Everybody, <laughs> everybody is ignorant just about different topics. You might be an expert in a certain field, right? Um, I'm an expert with, uh, for example, duct tape. I, I really understand and I have respect for duct tape. So, uh, I, so the, the idea was you know, to build a team who would compensate for my own inadequacies. So you have to do that if you want to build anything of any kind of substance. So build a team which is smarter than you. Again, it sounds simple, but there's this little concept, the ego, which gets in the middle. I have not been completely honest. My ambition, my vague ambition which I articulated, was not so much to demystify creation. I think most of you already know this is how it works, right? Creation is not this act of creation is not this one brilliant idea. It's these cyclical, very iterative series of 
failures from which you learn and then eventually somehow stumble across this finishing line with a product, right? Uh, so that you know. But my ambition from this 18 minutes is something much more tangible. I'm, I'm no longer an academic, so I'm very focused on tangibles. My tangible outcome, what I would classify as success from these 18 minutes, is that all of you, when you go back from this conference, think of a problem. I don't mean a big problem or a small problem. I don't know. I don't know the problem. You know the problem, right? Think of a problem you have experienced in your own life, or you have seen firsthand, you have seen, right? And you have seen that that problem has no solution. Very simple, right? Just think of that and come up with a solution, a duct tape solution, right? Release it. Make the solution work. You will fail, right? The first attempt will not be so good, will not be so elegant. You will fail. Keep doing it for 32 times, right? 32 times is a nice round number. Do it, keep failing. And then as you, as you keep doing that, let your passion show through to have enough smart people also say, hey, I can do better than that. You're an idiot, let me try it, right? And you'll, f you'll build the team that way. And I want all of you, that's my ambition, right? It's a very, a little bit, uh, I think, uh, uh, presumptuous of me to say that I can tell you what to do. So I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna ask you to please, one, two, three, find a problem, fix it, and build the team to help you do what you do best, right? That's it. Thank you very much.